My name is Vanessa Timmer. I'm the executive director of a nonprofit think and do tank called One Earth. And we're focused on how we can actually look at the innovation potential in moving from the take, make, waste uh, economy that we've been in, where we've basically taken lots of resources and because of cheap energy, moved it through into landfill, to the innovation potential that lies in regeneration, reducing the amount of resources we use, and, and exploring what this new, the new business models, the new economic models could be. So this is what today is about. It's about a new era for business and about those emerging drivers for what's called the circular economy. And I'm pleased to be joined by a great panel who is very experienced in what this means, examples of what is happening in the circular economy, and also what some of the challenges might be as we start making this transition. We're going to start with uh, a message from afar. So Dr. Yanis Potonik was, Potonik was actually uh, not able to join us here today. He is the uh, minister responsible for European affairs within the Republic of Slovenia. He's also an assistant professor of law. And he has been the me a member of the European Commissioner, Commission since 2004. And uh, initially he was responsible for science and research, but now he's the commissioner for the environment. And he has some opening remarks by video, uh, about four minutes, where he'll just talk a little bit about his understanding of what is the circular economy and what might be uh, the European response to this um, opportunity. So we'll now have the video from uh, Dr. Janis Potonik. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to have the opportunity to address you today and share some thoughts on one of the greatest challenges of our times, the resource challenge. Our economic system carries a legacy of decades of resource-intensive growth. We are far too tied to a linear economic model which extracts more and more resources only to discard them as waste. At the same time, global competition for resources keeps on increasing, driven by population growth and an expanding middle class with legitimate expectations of rising living standards. These trends will shape the future and inevitably affect all countries. We have already seen the signs of this as resource prices have been increasing fast since the beginning of this century to meet growing global demand. These global megatrends will shape the future. The world needs to be prepared to turn the challenges of this resource revolution into opportunities for sustainable growth. The recent economic crisis has rocked economies across the globe. No one believes that borrowing for more consumption is a good idea any longer. People increasingly recognize that business as usual is not an option. New, more sustainable sources of growth and prosperity have to be found. A resource efficient or green growth strategy is an exit from the current crisis, and this time in a sustainable way. This is why the European Commission has placed resource efficiency at the center of the Europe's economic growth strategy. There are huge gains for business and citizens from resource efficiency improvements. And more and more of these gains are within our reach. In Europe, a reduction in the total material requirement of around 20% can lead to an estimated 3% boost in GDP, while creating more than 2 million jobs. It is estimated that measures such as better eco-design, waste prevention, and reuse could bring net savings to businesses in the European Union of up to 600 billion euros, or 8% of their annual turnover. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation will no doubt provide further evidence of the potential value of the circular economy for the business and society later today. Ellen MacArthur herself is a member of the high-level European Resource Efficiency Platform, which I set up to guide the, tr the transition to a resource-efficient economy. This year, the European Commission will propose a set of measures to take resource efficiency a step further on the path towards a circular economy. I see this very much as part of our contribution to the universal goals of sustainable development, which we are working on following the Rio Plus 20 conference. We will be setting out the path to a circular economy in Europe, where nothing is wasted and where we get the greatest possible value out of resources and products by using them far more efficiently and keeping them in the economy for longer. Ladies and gentlemen, as policymakers, our responsibility is to provide the framework to make this transition possible. 
we have to create the necessary predictability to encourage the private sector to invest in resource-efficient innovation. But it will be for the private sector to make the transition a reality. The 21st century is the century of fragility, and we have to turn it into the century of sustainability. So-called long-term challenges are here, and we have to address them now. The problems that you will address at this conference are global, complex, and long-term. There are no quick fixes. My main message to you is to encourage all stakeholders, and in particular business, to embrace the transition to a resource-efficient and circular economy in a positive way, to focus on the opportunities for better design of products, to facilitate more and easier recycling, reuse and remanufacture of scarce, often expensive resources, to focus on the creation of services which rent or lease products, thereby increasing the level of reuse. And most importantly, to focus on the transition towards more sustainable growth. I look forward to the outcomes of your discussion, and of course, I would like to thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you so much. And I think what excites me about the circular economy is it's about efficiency gains, but we also have a challenge ahead of us of reducing our absolute material and energy throughput globally by 50%. And some of the innovations happening within the circular economy are not just about making the existing system more efficient, but actually looking at those absolute reductions. We are very fortunate because there is a organization that has taken the circular economy right into the heart of its ethos. And Jamie Butterworth is here. He is uh, very familiar with navigating complex spaces because he's a keen sailor. And it's because of this that he, I think because of this, that he met Ellen MacArthur. Um, also because at the time he was working, uh, you know, overseeing uh, global distribution on marine electronics as part of a group, business group called Navico Group. And with uh, Dame Ellen MacArthur, they launched a new foundation called the Ellen MacArthur Foundation with the sole intent of accelerating the transition to the circular economy. So the other panelists and I decided that we would have Jamie speak for a few minutes about giving the context of what is the circular economy. And then we're going to engage in a conversation about the possibilities and the challenges. So I'm going to ask Jamie to speak with us about what is the circular economy and tell us a little bit about what you're seeing as the most promising innovations. Jamie. Perfect. You can go there, here, there yeah, sure. I'll wander around a bit. Oh, you'll wander around. Fantastic. Yeah. So I wanted to talk to you about three things today. The first thing is the circular economy, what it is and what opportunities does it pose. The second is how individual businesses might win in a circular economy. And the third is just to share a little bit of the work of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation in helping to accelerate that transition. And to begin with, so what is the circular economy? And probably the easiest way to explain that to begin with is to look at the way the economy works today. So when we try to create value in the economy, at the end of the day, what we tend to do is to mine something out the ground in the form of a resource turn that into a product, sell it into a market, and then at the end of its life, we tend to dispose of it. And all throughout that process, we use large quantities of fossil fuel-derived energy. So if you look at the scale of that, it's absolutely staggering, the scale of linearity. We put 3.2 trillion US dollars into the fast-moving consumer goods economy, for example, each year. Um, and out of that $3.2 trillion, we waste $2.7 trillion of that value. Um, so you can look at this as a massive challenge or a massive opportunity, effectively, in terms of where the opportunity um, lies. Um, this graph here um, shows averaged global commodity prices coming into the economy. So this takes uh, four sub-indices for metals, non-metals, energy, and it also looks at agricultural commodities. So these are basically the commodities that come into the economy that we turn into uh, value. What's interesting about this graph is it shows how um, between about 1900 and about uh, 2002, we saw a gradual decline in those prices as we got better at extracting and processing those materials. However, in the last 10 years, we've seen that century's worth of price declines er erased in, in the last decade, effectively. And what's particularly interesting about this to the companies that we talk to and the economists um, who are interested in this subject is that this is before we see 
demand from an additional 3 billion middle class consumers who will come into the market between now and 2030. And we have to think this is also great news, right? Because these are people who will be brought into the same standard as living as we enjoy in the Western world. Um, however, at the same time, a linear economy works very well when the prices of resources and commodities are low. So it relies on cheap and available energy and materials to drive profit effectively. If that changes, if those system conditions change, doing that becomes uh, much harder. So the circular economy is a generic term for an economy which is um, restorative or regenerative by design. So it's generic and it brings together a range of different disciplines. And uh, one quote I like is of Isaac Newton that if we can see further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. So we're looking at a range of disciplines here from cradle to cradle to biomimicry. And it's fantastic we've got someone here to talk about that today. I think a key discipline in this topic, the performance economy, natural capitalism, industrial ecology, many different disciplines which I would define as going beyond efficiency. So they don't just look at doing less harm or trying to use a bit less material in the economy. They look at fundamentally changing the economy itself such that it becomes restorative, so that the more we do in the economy, the better it gets. So question is, how could we build, or how might we build, a circular economy? So if we take our linear um, take, make, dispose economy, and we would end up with two types of stuff. We would have technical materials, things like alloys, metals, polymers, which would cycle at the highest possible quality in perpetuity. And separated from that distinctly would be biological materials, and that would be materials which are defined to flow back through food and farming systems and actually be regenerative. More interesting than this maybe also is what then happens if you push this model further. And really, we, it provides a model for value creation. So in the technical side of the economy, probably the last thing you'd want to do is cycle materials. You'd move towards refurbishment and remanufacture, towards reuse and redistribution, and ultimately towards selling um, the performance of a product rather than the product itself. Um, so one example of that would be uh, Philips, who are now selling a service called Pay by Lux Lighting. So they don't sell light bulbs, they sell the light itself, a number of lumens in a B2B application. This enables them to retain ownership of the valuable materials um, and components that they can then upgrade. It means that when they come up with a more energy efficient LED lighting technology, they make the margin on providing the light at a better value. And it also shifts them to provide a better service um, for those customers. So multiple things in, entail. And in the biological side, we can see the same types of things unfold, where we're able to actually start to restore and regenerate food and farming systems. We can move into large-scale anaerobic digestion, composting, and the types of um, outputs from that in terms of biogas and, and other um, phosphate extraction. And we can move into higher still in terms of chemical feedstock extraction, um, all before we've cascaded those materials in the biological um, side of the economy. And I think we'll hopefully hear more from Dana as well in terms of how biomimicry also enables us to go beyond extracting value into learning from living systems to actually um, evolve that. Um, so the other thing that circular economy does is it begins to change the relationship that the industrial economy has with energy. Um, and I'll give one example of what I mean by that. So an automotive manufacturer in Europe quite successfully employs circular practices. They're called Renault. And they can take the drivetrain, the engine, or the gearbox of a car. They can take that at the end of its life, send it through a plant on the west coast of France, and they can remanufacture that and send it back out the door with the same guarantee and warranty as a new product. They can actually upgrade it when it goes through that process. Um, when they do that, not only is that the most profitable part of their global operations, but it also uses 85% less energy than if they were to build a new um, engine block. So I don't know who was in Amory Lovins' discussion yesterday, but if we wish to shift the industrial economy to using different types of energy, this approach begins to decouple the economy from um, fossil fuel inputs. So in 2011, the foundation working together with McKinsey um, wanted to ask the question, what would this be worth if we tried to make the, the transition towards a circular economy? So we took a subsector of the European economy. We took medium-lived, complex goods, um, things like mobile phones, washing machines, um, TVs. That makes up 47.5% of EU manufacturing. 
And we said if we took um, products in that category and we took the very conservative estimate that we'd be able to cycle 20% of the materials or components in those products once more than we do today by 2025, what, what would that be worth? And we spoke to the manufacturers of those products. We did some quite in-depth analysis on that. And effectively, that would be worth 630 billion um, euros, sorry, US dollars um, to the European market, which makes up for about 3 to 4% of GDP. So very significant figure, even at a very conservative rate. And this is within existing um, legislative conditions. Um, so I just wanted now to use uh, one example to talk through how there are some disciplines which can be used by businesses to um, win in the circular economy effectively. And who's got um, a mobile phone in here? I suspect most people, right? Who's got a drawer at home where you've got some old mobile phones? Anyone else? Yeah, good, right. So my wife was coming up for an upgrade for her phone from her service provider from an iPhone 4 to an iPhone 5. So she got the new iPhone 5 and the iPhone 4 was left in the drawer. So I thought, right, what are we going to do with that? And I got a letter through the post that said, we'll buy your iPhone 4 from you for 200 pounds. And I thought, 200 pounds, that's quite a lot of money. It's like 350 uh, Canadian dollars. That, I'll, I'll probably have that. So I sent it to this company. They sent me the check for $350, um, and I was left astounded. I thought, this is absolutely crazy. I mean, why would the service provider not want to keep that $350? At about the same time, a couple of uh, service providers in Europe launched new contracts. One of them was called Vodafone Red Hot, um, which now provides people with an 18-month technology refresh cycle. So you never own the hardware. You bring your old phone back in, they change the software over, they give you the new hardware. What they then do is they sell that hardware into a secondary market or they decomponentize it at high quality using um, providers like Umicore, for example. Now that's quite interesting. So that's the business model innovation. They don't need to persuade consumers to bring their product back in store. They've changed their business model such that it works. Um, the next part to this is design. So actually, those products, that iPhone, for example, was never designed for a circular economy. It was designed for a linear economy where it left that manufacturer and never came back. This example is a company called PhoneBlocks, um, which has a concept phone um, designed for modular upgrade, effectively. Um, they're now working with uh, Motorola and Google to develop an um, upgradable phone for, for the circular economy, effectively. So you can start to see that if you fuse the design with the business model, you open the opportunity. And the companies that do this really well are really optimizing this process in their business. They're embedding the idea in a continual improvement technique. And this diagram behind me is Ricoh's Comet Orbit, which is a continual improvement process they put in place in their print photocopier design to actually shift from the right-hand side, which is very low-value waste to landfill, waste to energy recycling, right the way into remanufacturing and service provision. So companies that do it well really embed that within the business. They can measure it. They can put that process in place and align it with incentives. So how do businesses win? Basically, four things we believe. The first one is getting the enabling business model right. And that's as important for an automotive company as it is for a fast-moving consumer goods company. It might not all be the business model in one, one company's um, supply chain. It might exist across an ecosystem of different companies. Second, optimizing the product design and the material type such that it is inherently circular. Third, the reverse cycle, so the collection, the treatment, the redeployment process, optimizing that. And fourth, these enabling conditions. So actually, you could significantly increase the scale and speed of this if you were to look at education, policy, legislation, other drivers. In 2005, a lady called Ellen MacArthur became the fastest person ever to sail single-handed, non-stop around the world. She sailed around the world in 72 days and, and 14 hours. And to do that, she sailed a very fast type of boat called a trimaran, so a three-hull boat, and was the, third, the second person ever to sail around the world on such a boat. And that, that one you can see on the screen, you can actually climb up the inside of the mast on there. Um, it's quite a big bit of kit. And to do that, you need to take the absolute minimum of everything that you have when you go around in terms of water, in food, in diesel, the whole lot. And when Ellen got back from the Around the World race, she became fascinated by that link between the use of resources and the use of energy and the use of resources and energy in the economy. And she spent five years looking at this subject and meeting some fascinating people, um, some of whom were on that slide before, who really caused her to think differently. And at that point, she decided to set up the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. 
And we see our role as the circular economy provides a vision for the type of economy that we wish to build. Today's economy is pr predominantly linear, and that part in the middle is where we are, a transition stage. And that transition is going to be a big job. It's going to be huge. And we see our role as finding those interactions where we can have a disproportionately large impact, a bit like acupuncture in the economy. Where can we do something that will have a change effectively? And as such, we work in um, three different areas. Um, we work in business innovation, where we work with a group of global corporations, emerging innovators, and regions um, to build capacity and help to address common barriers to progress. Um, we also work in education, where our aim is to inspire a generation to rethink the future. Um, we work with universities in design, engineering, and business in the US, Europe, India, and Canada. And we work in quantifying and providing insight around the opportunity and how we can address those barriers. And one project we launched this year in Davos with the World Economic Forum and McKinsey aims to do just that and engage a group of CEOs around um, this topic. So before we move on to the Q&A, uh, I just wanted to tell one very short story which I think sums up how we see this idea. And we do a lot of work with um, schools and um, in education. And we were working with a group of teachers, and one of the teachers had been teaching a student in design technology. And they told us um, this story. And they said the student had come to them and said that when they were 15 and they were studying for their GCSE exam, which is an exam in the UK, they had an open design part to their challenge. They could design anything they wanted. And they said, we were asked to design something, and I couldn't think of anything design. Everything had kind of been done before, whether it's a car or a chair or a computer or whatever. When I learned about the circular economy, now, everything I see, I want to redesign. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Jamie. That, that was great. It gave a really great context of what this could be, and particularly about thinking about redesigning. And we're very lucky to have a panel who's been thinking a lot about redesigning our lifestyles, our society, our economy, yes. including Bruce, Bruce Lorry, who's right next to Jamie. He is one of Canada's leading environmentalists. He's a, a, an author of a recent book called Talks In, Talks Out, which is getting harmful chemicals out of our bodies and our world, and the bestseller, Slow Death by Rubber Duck. If you've not read these, I would highly recommend them. He's also the president of the Ivy Foundation, and with the Ivy Foundation, he knows a lot about the type of collaborations that Jamie's speaking about because they have done large-scale collaborations on the Canadian boreal forest as well as on health. And um, what happened is that Bruce, like uh, Ellen MacArthur, has been recently looking at shifting the Ivy Foundation's focus towards green and new economies. And he works with um, other groups such as the uh, Consultative Group on Biodiversity and the World Wildlife Fund, um, and he does a lot of work with the, uh, bringing the environmental foundations together through the Canadian environmental grant makers. So welcome, Bruce. And uh, we're really looking forward to hearing uh, what you have to say. Um, what I'll do is I'm going to introduce the rest of the panel, and then we'll come back to ask all of you, what is it going to take based on what Jamie was just presenting? So next to Bruce is Christian. He also knows a lot about chemicals because he's part of BASF, who we heard from yesterday in the opening presentations. And he's the head of SET, which is part of the nutrition and health part of BASF. And they're working with sustainable brands to look at redesigning, like what Jamie was saying, those consumer goods. We see Christian um, come to different events around the world, around food, around shifting economics, particularly because Christian has a deep knowledge of sustainable development guidelines about whole supply chain uh, innovation and also about traceability. So how do we actually follow this through the system? And uh, BASF was part of the development of the Sustainability Consortium. And what's interesting is Christian's involved around traceability both at the U.S. level with the U.S. National Traceability Initiative but also globally is collaborating to make traceability happen. So welcome to you, Christian. You. And as Jamie mentioned, Danny, Dana Baumeister is here from the Biomimicry 3.8 um, Institute, which she co-founded with Janine Benyus. In fact, Janine and Dana have been working together for decades, and it is because of Dana's deep knowledge in natural history, in ecology and biology, that she's become, she has done many degrees in those areas. And what's really interesting is that she has actually focused her efforts on supporting 
the redesign of our world through looking at nature. And she works with companies like Nike, Interface, Seventh Generation, with the Biomimicry Guild to, sorry, with the Biomimicry 3.8 Institute uh, to focus on how we might redesign if we look to nature as inspiration. And she's worked with many uh, different practitioners in training them in how to use nature's principles for redesign. So welcome, Dana. And next to me here is Peter Laybourne, and he's applied the same idea of natural systems to industrial ecosystems. So he takes a look at, uh, he got very inspired by a byproduct exchange that was happening in the Gulf of Mexico, and founded something in the United Kingdom called International Synergies. And the national industrial symbiosis programs that are in the UK and also around the world look at how resources from one industry that might become, that are perhaps wasted in that, for example, waste heat or waste products could become the resources for another part of the industry. So what if we thought about industrial clusters as we would an ecosystem where waste is not a waste but a resource to be used? And what's interesting about Peter is he comes from a combination of an ecology and economics background, which he brought to the aerospace industry. And he's been a sustainability consultant as well for Shell for their work on exploration and production. But it's his work on international synergies that I think really helps us here think about the circular economy. He's received a Sustainable Leaders Award in 2013 in the UK for his work on that. And it's a really concrete example of what this could look like and the innovation potential. So Jamie brought forward three acupuncture points from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Business collaborations on innovation education as a key part of this, and analysis of the business case, which is what they're focusing on. So I just want to ask all of you, what do you think it's going to take to get us to the circular economy? What is an acupuncture point that you think is really worth focusing on? Who would like to go first? Well, I'll Bruce. take a stab yeah. at that, go Vanessa. Ahead. Um, you know, first of all, I, I think it's really great to see the kind of models and frameworks that the circular economy represents because, uh, you know, for many of us, we look at these issues, they're very complex, uh, there are many different moving parts, and uh, to have something that is presented in a clear framework that, you know, literally you can put up with, uh, with uh, icons and diagrams and, and immediately understand it, I think is very powerful. So for me, it's, it's uh, you know, when I hear about the, uh, you know, companies that are doing things because they're saving money, then I start to think, well, what are the things that will make them save more money? So what are the economic signals that will get more businesses uh, to actually adopt these kinds of ideas because they will be saving more money? And, uh, and in, in, a, in many cases, I don't think we lack technical innovation, we lack social innovation, and we lack uh, public policy innovation. And so that's really the intersection that we're going to be looking at at the Ivy Foundation, is how do we create new ways of, of interacting and collaborating, and how can we actually uh, uh, look at investing in the kinds of public policy and regulatory changes that will spur and further development, uh, develop uh, the, uh, the, the initiatives that the, the circular economy is, is promoting. So that, that's kind of where that's where I'm sitting anyway. Great, Bruce, and actually I'd like to come to Peter for that because actually one of the things I've learned from international synergies is the importance of the social technology is the way we bring people together. Peter, Peter can you speak a little bit to that, building on what Bruce said? Yeah, yeah, yeah certainly. Uh, I, um, uh, very quickly, I, I just want to pick up on something that uh, um, Jamie said uh, about working with the recall comet model, and it was because they had that circularity in their model that when the Japanese tsunami hit, their business wasn't affected, yet many others were. Mm. And it's because they've adopted that approach that, that mm. they were safe. Back to the question, um, uh, I think it was Thomas Gradle um, from the uh, industry ecology area who, who first said that uh, waste is just a resource in the wrong place. Mm. And what we try to do with our industry symbiosis programs is to have a mass engagement model. Uh, so we pump it out as, this is a business opportunity program. It's not an environmental program, but because we're dealing with resources, we get that core benefit as well. Uh, so just to put some numbers on that, I think in, in seven years in the UK model, uh, something like 45 uh, million tons of carbon were reduced 
38 million tons of waste taken out of the landfill, but at the same time that was happening, we created 10,000 jobs. And we saved uh, businesses about uh, 2 billion Canadian dollars and had additional sales about the same amount. So I think with, with um, the right engagement model at scale, uh, you can have this elusive win-win-win. And when you're saying the engagement model, do you find people come in because they're looking for the circular economy? Are they using that way of framing it? Well, I, I think initially uh, uh, we, we use the phrase of working with the willing. So, so people come in, uh, but, but the program has grown quite organically. So I think we've dealt in total with about 15,000 companies. And uh, the model now has been taken and is being uh, used in about another uh, 20 countries around the world. Uh, but what we find is, is, is that the companies come in initially uh, you know, to save some money, uh, so they come in for that type of region to get the business opportunity. Uh, but during the course of the program and the course of the engagement, uh, it gives us a chance to introduce some of these other concepts like uh, design for environment, like biomimicry, like cleaner production. So if you can get the engagement, I think we have a chance then to introduce more aspects of the circular economy. Well, that's interesting. So maybe the things that bring people in are actually not where they necessarily take um, it. So part correct. of it is perhaps making that business case that Jamie was arguing, yeah. creating an enabling space that Bruce was describing and making sure we think about the social, but also realizing once we have people engaged, that we can actually connect with them on deeper levels around these larger changes. Uh, what do you think it takes, uh, Christian, what do you think it takes to, uh, to get us to a circular economy? Um, let, me, let me start by saying that it's an honor to be here in this panel. And um, <clears throat> so thank you for the invitation, Jamie. Thank you for the great uh, introduction to the concept. Um, I think we have to put uh, things into context, okay? So let's think of um, why are we talking about sustainability? because we don't have enough, because we have to provide enough for an increase in population. Uh, we're running out of stuff, right? So if you think of the beneficiary of that model, um, we have to think of end consumers, right? So everything that we do, mm -hmm. it has to have an impact, a positive impact to the end consumer, to the, to the goods that we're putting on the shelf. And it has to be recognized, ideally, by the end consumers, because that's how they're going to relate to, to the product and, and maybe be inspired to do the same thing. So what I would say it's very important to do is do a uh, kind of like what Jamie did very schematically with that 4.7% uh, uh, of, of uh, you know, the economy in Europe, just focusing on one market segment, and take segment by segment and do a thorough analysis of where exactly um, this type of um, economy can be applied. Because mm. I'm sure it's not gonna be one size fits all. You cannot put it everywhere. There's gonna be low hanging fruits. Um, last but not least, people get inspired by, by success stories. So mm. what we need is we need a lot of those. We need a lot of those marketed, I would say, to governments, uh, a lot of those marketed to the end consumers. and. Um, last but not least, to the industry, because we're going to be the ones that are going to have to make it happen. Great. Yeah, so finding those uh, great examples and hotspots where we might be able to put right. first attention, exactly. and those can then build to the right. to other aspects of it. And, and don't, don't take it as this is going to solve all our problems. Mm -hmm. This is going to be part of the solution. And we're going to have to identify exactly where to plug it in right now with the best output for that feeding 9 billion people type of concept. Great. And thinking about redesign, how much part of the solution is this, Dana, in terms of your understanding of where we need to go from the biomimicry perspective? Well, from the biomimicry perspective and from the perspective as a biologist, um, I have to remind us all that we're not immune to the laws of natural selection. And uh, as much as we want to imagine that uh, we can design or not design and figure this out, you know, the planet has a lot of uh, rules and system rules of what it means to live here. And so when we ask the question of what's it going to take to change, we have to recognize that the rules of the game have changed. On one, plan on one level, at the planetary level, those rules have not changed. But we've succeeded as a species as well as we have for all these years because we've acted like weeds. And weeds do very well. They're type one ecosystems. Um, they come in, they have a, an area where there's tons of resources, tons of energy. 
They grow fast, reproduce a lot, use a lot of materials, and that actually serves them very well. And then they produce a lot more seeds and they spread. And, and the problem is, is that we have done that and done that and, and then colonized the next habitat and the next habitat, next habitat. And as Janine says, we've come around the world and bumped into ourselves. <laughs> So what happens in natural ecosystems is a type one field or a meadow will convert into a type two ecosystem, which ultimately converts into a type three ecosystem. And you use the term ecosystem. And indeed, that's exactly what we're moving towards right now. And a type three ecosystem is one that has to stay in place. And that's where we are. We, we don't have the option of going somewhere else, although certainly people are proposing the moon and the bottom of the ocean and other places. But the reality is this, this terra firma is working reasonably well, and we should start here. So we have to then adopt the rules of a type three ecosystem. And the entire linear economy was based on the old rules. And the reality is that those rules have changed. And if we as a species don't recognize those changing rules, so what's it gonna take? A huge recognition mm. that those rules apply to us. And there are things like, no, there are not unlimited resources. And no, energy is not cheap. And yes, you actually have to cooperate with your neighbors to figure this out. All of which we can learn by going from a walk in the woods. You know, yeah. When we can look at these type three ecosystems, they've been around and ask them what it takes, takes to be here. So for me, it's, it's this incredible opportunity because we don't have to figure this out by ourselves. Mm -hmm. right? The lessons are out there for us to learn from. Absolutely, so it seems like it's a really, it's a transformative change. And uh, so Jamie, you were bringing up a few examples which were kind of really out of the normal model. And as Christian says, those examples might really help us to look at what this type of change could be to this new way of understanding that Dana is referencing. So what examples do we do you find inspire you in terms of what's happening with the circular economy taking you to taking us to that other level? Yeah, question. I, I, I can use a couple of examples from BSF actually. I don't know if we call that circular economy, but certainly we're looking at trying to implement as input some of the output. Um, so one of them deals with construction chemicals. We have a, a model there called Green Sense. It's branded as such, where uh, we actually replace a part of the Portland um, cement that goes into the concrete, which is very uh, extensive to produce in terms of energy and emissions, with uh, things like uh, slag that comes out of uh, iron mining and uh, fly ash that, <laughs> that comes out of um, you know power plants. And, uh, of course, we have to add in a little bit of a BSF magic in there, but um, if you take the Freedom Tower in New York City, for example, that tower has been built with this technology from BSF, and there we were able to replace about 70% of the cement with this type of mixture, mm -hmm. with the green sand. So that's one option. The other one um, that you can actually visit at the BSF booth is uh, we've taken uh, these uh, Navy design, U.S. Navy design chairs, um, and uh, we created a what we call a one-one-one Navy chair because it's made of a it's made of a hundred and eleven uh, one-liter Coca-Cola bottles each chair. So you put a little bit of uh, uh, fiberglass in it and, and paint that comes from BSF, but you're putting that output to a good use to something that's going to last for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have. More examples, but, you know. Great. Christian, yeah, Jamie. No, I just thought of, I mean, I think the fascinating thing about if you were to build the circular economy, biomimicry would be one of the key um, disciplines that you would use, I think, to inform that. Mm -hmm. And just one example I was thinking of was um, that if you were to do this, like kind of optimize this process. So one of the companies that we work with is actually Unilever. Mm -hmm. And if you look at Unilever's, uh, the size of the company and the supply chain and what they wish to do, if you were to set up a more circular model, you would shift towards an optimized palette of materials mm -hmm. that you would run in as either biological or technical parts within the economy. And I was thinking of um, something that I've heard um, Dana and um, Janine talk about, 
which is this analogy with living systems, whereby I believe in living systems, and please correct me, <laughs> that there are effectively five different types of polymer, basically, that make up every single living thing from a blade of grass through to a, a beetle. And that brilliant example of the beetle, whereby the endoskeleton, which is hard, and the wings, which are semi-flexible and colored, is all created through structure, effectively. So it's kind of two interesting things there. One is, as we shift the way we manufacture things in the next five or 10 years towards um, additive manufacturing and things, we'll be able to create more diversity and structure. And there are companies now, I believe, creating um, the right materials to do that. But secondly, it almost provides the insight into how you would make that happen. So the insight from living systems provides some of the model as to how you'd begin to optimize um, Unilever as a large company. Mm -hmm. And I think it's that type of insight that we're beginning to see now transfer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and I, I think one of the things around thinking about natural systems, and, and while circular economy is an excellent word to, to counter the idea of linear economy, it's really, we've got to start actually calling an interdependent economy, you know, economy, an, an interconnected economy. Uh, it's not just the single loop. And, and I think sometimes when businesses work with this, they're sort of, how do I get you know, my piece of metal back into my backyard so I can make it again? And the reality is a leaf doesn't, or a tree doesn't turn a leaf back into a leaf. Um, it, it sheds the vast majority of those molecules because it's too darn expensive to figure out how to get a leaf back into a leaf. And so if we start thinking of it as a web, you know, in the industrial symbiosis space, that, that really the option of over there, or the landfill, or the end just simply doesn't exist, and everything must stay in that system somehow. That's ultimately, that even that frame of reference is gonna be absolutely essential for designing a circular economy. And part of it is, what are we designing with? What are we actually building with? And how much energy are we putting into that? So the laws of thermodynamics teach us that the amount of energy that it takes to assemble things is going to be the same amount to disassemble them. And when we heat, beat, and treat everything we make, we shouldn't be so surprised that it's awfully hard to pull it back apart again. Uh, whereas life is using sunlight and basal metabolism, you know, the life-friendly temperatures and chemistry and pressure in order to assemble things. Fundamental, huge shifts. I mean, redesign is, is rethinking how we design in order to redesign. Great, that's very helpful to think about, not just one loop, which I think is often where we get stuck, but really thinking about that interdependent and thinking about the energy required, yeah. Mm -hmm. Peter, do you want to speak to some of the examples you know of in terms of how we do this type of uh, redesign? Yeah, yeah, yes, certainly. The, um, w w one thing that just struck me there is that uh, one, one of the things we try to do with the um, Industry Symbiosis Program is address the market uh, failure, if you like, market failure in this case of information. Uh, but one thing we can't do anything about at the moment is uh, the, pr the price of carbon. Uh, it's just not high enough. And um, I, I think uh, I was speaking with the Commissioner Hedegaard, I think the uh, uh, pr price uh, across Europe at the moment is, is about five euros per tonne. And you know, m most in in informed people say you, you, we've got to be looking at you know, 30, 60, 90 euros a ton. So that's something that I think we've got to work on and we need uh, the regulators and the politicians to help with. Mm -hmm. But just some great um, examples. We've got thousands in the program, uh, many of them on the website, but two of my favorites. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, my, my hometown in uh, uh, um, England was Billingham in the Northeast, it was the home of the chemical industry. There. And uh, when I was growing up, uh, you had purple sunsets, green sunsets, depending on what the chemical uh, companies were making. But now it's one of the largest tomato manufacturers in, in Europe. And one, one of the chemical companies, it's an example of co-location, um, byproducts were uh, waste CO2 and waste heat. So we've got a market gardener to co-locate there. And, and, and the heat is just pumped into the greenhouses. The CO2 is used as a growing medium. That's created about 30 jobs in the area, and, and it's a very rundown area. And of course, now that the UK doesn't have to import uh, some more tomatoes. And one quick further example, um, I like it because it's an example of culture change, which you can have by this type of engagement. Um, it was an animal renderer uh, north of Birmingham, uh, basically the burned dead animals. And it was seen as a dirty industry that nobody in the community wanted anything to do with. And over a period of time, 
by engaging in a greater network, they've changed their mindset and they've converted the company uh, from a, a dirty animal renderer into a clean energy company. And they've done that by getting rid of the, if you like, the uh, physical fraction into cement industry and pet food, the liquid fraction into biodiesel, improved the efficiency of their burners, then they got into biodiesel, then into AD, and now they're exporting um, energy to the grid. And five years previously, they were a heavy energy user. So you can get this transform transformative uh, change going. Yeah, great, thank you, Peter. And I'm gonna come back to this point you made about carbon pricing and ask Bruce about the role of government. And then I'm just gonna to note to, you, to all of you that we're gonna uh, now enter into a conversation with all of you. So um, once we've talked about the role of government in this transition, I'd welcome you to uh, ask a question, uh, make a brief comment uh, to continue the conversation together. So Bruce, I just wanted to ask you, you know, is this transition gonna happen through voluntary means within business, or what do you think is the role of government here? Yeah, I don't, I mean, ultimately, um, no, it won't happen entirely voluntarily. Uh, but I, you know, I don't want to throw a wet blanket on great success stories. But we, because success stories are hugely important, but we have a lot of success stories that are um, very localized, uh, specific businesses, specific product lines, where we can see very good examples of the kind of change we need. But that needs to be broadened out to a, a much greater systemic level and a global level. If we look at all of the major indicators of uh, sustainability in terms of carbon emissions, the production of plastics, um, waste generation per capita, they're all going in the wrong direction, right? So the, so the macro indicators are simply not going in the direction that we need for sustainability. So that means we need to do something differently. We need to change the rules of the game. And in the same way that we've got ecological rules, we, we now have economic rules that don't favor doing the right thing for ecology. And that means we need to, I mean, you know, this isn't new. Economists for, for 30 years have been telling us that we need to internalize the external costs of dealing with, uh, dealing with manufacturing and, and energy production. So, so ultimately, I think the answer is uh, governments are the ones that will have to set the rules and, uh, and businesses will follow the rules in a way that I think will, will ultimately get us to where we need to get to in terms of a circular economy. But the question is, how do we go about doing that? And I think even then, which is why we, we touched on the ideas of social innovation, because the way we did things historically around setting those rules, I don't think work any longer. Governments don't lead. Um, we need to engage businesses much more effectively in designing the rules that, are, that, are, that will accommodate a transition as opposed to you know, being, you know, you're gonna do this on this date. Um, and then that's, that's really what drives, I think, ultimately, that's what drives innovation, and that's what's gonna drive the change. And then we need to figure out also uh, um, effective roles for, uh, for broader uh, society to participate in, in those kinds of decisions as well. So it's, it's not, you know, it's not, not, not a simple answer, but I, I think we're, um, with these kinds of models, we can start to, to see a way through yeah, that kind of cross-sectoral collaboration, but also very much with that those rules established to create the enabling space. Does anyone want to make a comment about this as well, Dan? I just want to add that, yeah, there's, there are these planetary rules which supersede all of humanity, you know, and, and we have a very disconnect between the rules of the game that we're playing with right here. And, and the first step is actually to get rid of the rules that send us in the wrong direction, right? Those, those sort of incentives that are still in place that keep promoting the linear economy. We can wait for natural selection to weed out the ones that aren't figuring it out, and chances are we're all going to be weeded out in that process unless we start bringing in greater alignment the rules of the game that we're playing yeah. by with the rules of the planetary game. Yeah. Um, and part of it is getting rid of those, and then part of it is developing the new ones that incentivize the type three ecosystem behaviors that we want to see. Yeah. And, and for me, getting, uh, creating the new ones, the assumption is you're getting rid of the old ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like a yeah, yeah. simultaneous systemic uh, change. Yeah. Jamie. No, I, I was going to echo the point that, so you, it misaligned incentives that exist today. So for example, making fossil fuel energies cheaper um, obviously are not going to help any of this transition. So that's an immediate first step that you would make if you wish to make this happen. I think the second thing, and I, I agree with Bruce, that for a accelerated transition, some key policy levers would make this happen faster. And you can use the framework of the circular economy to work out what those would be. So actually, 
the levers you would employ would be different to zero waste levers, for example, because mm. you're not just trying to minimize waste, you're trying to maximize value. You're trying to go beyond burning waste to actually reusing components, material, shifting to service. So they're subtly but importantly different. And I think that the other bit that Bruce said that I think is important is um, that we really need the businesses to want to make the change. And what I mean there is I was talking to actually someone yesterday about extended producer responsibility. I don't know if people have heard of that, but the idea of companies um, being responsible for the um, product at the end of its life. Now, some companies that we talk to think this is great news because ultimately they have very valuable products that if they could find a way that they could get those back, they would be able to remanufacture them, upgrade them, make more money out of them, right? Mm -hmm. But if that change, which has, I've been involved in other discussions where policymakers have said, let's put you know, extended producer responsibility as a, as a policy lever into the market, it will probably be pushed out. So what you actually, I think, what we need here is those proactive companies. Firstly, we need to roll our sleeves up. We need to start doing this. And we're beginning to see more and more examples of companies doing that, including this big group through the World Economic Forum. But also, um, you then need them to start saying, but we're actually being stopped from going mm -hmm. further. We want to go further, and you need to give us a level playing field. And I think that is now also just beginning to happen, and we need to be very clever to keep pushing that forward. Mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. great. OK, great. Well, I see people standing by the microphone. Great, thanks. Thank you for that. So let's start with the question about training. Um, I know, Dana, you might want to say a few words about the trainings you offer. Yeah, well, actually, I can, I'm really excited that just two days ago, um, Arizona State University approved uh, the curricula to adopt biomimicry as the first master's in the United States. So oh, um, pretty big news. And there are a number of universities that we've visited and have been around, I know that biomimicry is being taught more and more in lots of places. You can find degrees in sustainability, and definitely this next generation is demanding different answers. You know, they're, they're kind of uh, fed up with us and a little disgusted at what we're handing over, and, uh, and therefore are asking different questions, and in fact, the instructors uh, and faculty are struggling to catch up, you know, to be able to say, okay, well, I have to figure out what it is on how to teach you this. Um, but I'm, I'm definitely heartened to see that, that uh, I meet more and more students today that have heard of things like industrial ecology and biomimicry and symbioses and all those, those aspects are showing up more, more and more, which is great. Yeah, and here in Vancouver, the BC Institute of Technology has a great program on industrial symbiosis that Tracy Casavant teaches, which is definitely worth checking out. Other ones that people know of that, yeah, Jamie. Yeah, so a couple of examples, and actually um, biomimicry is being taught in quite a lot of universities in Europe as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that this is beginning to move. We have a fellowship program that brings together professors with a, a student for a year long fellowship program, and we work with um, MIT, Yale, Stanford, and Berkeley in the US. And Stanford, I know, is setting up an elective course on the circular economy um, beginning soon. And also, um, this is virtual, so you could join it from anywhere. But the University of Bradford launched last month the first ever MBA, which looks at business administration. But from a future view of the economy is changing, we need to look at different models. Um, which is an online course, so it's um, distance learning MBA. So there's a few different people offering things out there. And maybe, Jimmy, you can pick up on the other question, which is what is that, you know, this is the, an MBA, very practical course, how can we get things done? So what would you say, uh, we've heard some examples of practical things that are happening, but what would you say to that question around, what so would I, you do? I think the mm -hmm. gentleman's question was specifically around, um, like, product. Is that right, product in the market? I can't see. Yeah, products yeah. So, in the market. Yeah. I mean, we've given lots of technical examples, um, but like one great example, which many people may have watched his TED talk or seen him speak before, is uh, Eben Bayer's Ecovative uh, model. So he's part of this Circular Economy 100 group that we run. And uh, he took um, inspiration from living systems, effectively, to look at packaging. And he said that a really big 
um, issue and opportunity is around polystyrene in the economy. So polystyrene is very, very difficult to get rid of once you've finished with it, unless you burn it, basically. So he's developed a um, product which effectively uses waste feedstock. So he uses cof um, coffee grounds and other uh, biological materials to grow packaging. So the packaging is actually uh, made from mycelium, which is effectively the root system of mushrooms. And this sounds crazy until um, you see the size of the scale of the operation that he's running and the fact that he's now supplying, I believe, Electrolux and Dell um, with some of their packaging at a price point which is compatible with polystyrene. But there are many, many different case studies. In fact, on our website, we have about uh, probably 30 or 40 of them of good examples of people starting to innovate real products. Great. Examples. I've got yeah. one in, in the sense that I'm actually fascinated by those technologies that are both sort of products, but they're also enabling technologies because, you know, Ecovative in a way is enabling a different way to think about packaging and then, of course, they're selling it as packaging. Um, one that I came across actually a couple of years ago um, is a European company called Zelfo. And they have a very, very simple um, piece of equipment that can turn waste biological material, um, brasses and, and you know, straw, whatever, into sheet goods, you know, and, and that are actually resilient, strong, with no additive materials, no extra, it, you know, it's the pressure of a hand crank, essentially. Um, and, and by learning on how cellulose bonds together. And that, while they don't even really know what could we make with it, is an incredible enabling technology because we've talked about scale, and the scale is not creating one big manufacturing plant in the middle of, of uh, Europe where everything is sent and it's processed and then sent back out, but it's lots of small manufacturing systems. And something like this little homegrown thing you pull on a cart behind and suddenly you're building uh, walls you know, and building materials from your waste crop in your fields, uh, I think has huge potential. And, and as we think about an emerging circular economy, it's not just how do we tweak the products we're making now, but what are the technologies that we need going forward? And 3D manufacturing is a huge space. Uh, and, and we've got to be asking the question now of what are we putting into these 3D printers? And where is that going at the end of its life? Uh, we're all fascinated by the forms that are produced, but when you have your own 3D printer, do we really want little Johnny taking out the toxic trash you know, from what we're making? So this, the circular economy has to be involved in all of these enabling technology conversations on how we're gonna pull it off as well. Yeah. well I, I, I can Here. certainly think of a, um, a couple of reasons to be cheerful. Um, I was absolutely blown away a couple of weeks ago uh, when a major high street bank uh, came to us and asked, can, we, can you train all our frontline bank managers in industrial symbiosis? And I, I didn't see that one coming. Yeah. And I, I think the reason is, and it's logical if you think about it, that they're lending money to businesses. They want to secure their investment. And one of the, way, the ways to see of doing that, well, if, if a company engages in IS or circular economy techniques, it's more likely to succeed. So it's more likely to give a return on the investment. So that came totally left field uh, a, f a few weeks ago. But I think there's something around um, uh, demand-led innovation. So if we can create the space for innovation to happen by bringing companies from different sectors together, mixing that up with entrepreneurs and VCs and uh, universities, we can get this real demand pull on innovation. And I, I once saw it happen right in front of my eyes. We were at a workshop. People were talking about the problem of storing waste food. And a, a lady called, um, I forget the name now, but a company's called Angel Heart. She just said, leave it with me. And within a couple of weeks, she had this idea of something called a grot box. Very simple, low technology, but you can store food until such time, or so, store waste food until such time they can be collected and taken away to AD or composting. Simple solution, but very effective. And that came from you know, this creating space for innovation to happen. Mm, great. Practical comments. Do you, Christian, um, do you want I to just say? have a quick one. So um, we did with, um, with the set service that we provide to some of our um, key partners in the, in the food value chain, we did a project with uh, the U.S. beef industry. So we took, with the help of National Calamans and Beef Association, the entire beef industry in the U.S. and put it on a path to create more sustainable beef. And one of the 
um, things that, that came out of the assessment is that uh, manure is a critical issue there. And uh, we see more and more examples of some of the producers that are using manure now to uh, produce electricity. Great. Them. Great, thank you. Can't All right, we have time yeah. for one more. Yes, one more. <laughs> and then we'll come to you. Well, I've sir. been working with Interface Carpets, actually. I think this is their carpet on the floor mm -hmm. here. And um, for almost 16 years. And in addition to sort of product design, one of the things that has been really interesting is how they think about manufacturing differently and investing in the infrastructure to achieve this, even though they don't know what the final you know, world will look like if there is such a thing as final. So their, their latest big piece of equipment is one that is designed to be able to take lots of different feedstocks and produce lots of different products, mm -hmm. as opposed to that, even though it's a linear machine, it can take, you know, um, all sorts of different plastic derivatives from, from cars, from fishing nets, from, you know, you name it, in order to create the new base material that they can use. And so when we think about our capital investments, being aware that this is where the world is going and how we invest will be a critical Great. part, too. Great. Yes, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so we actually have a, the project I mentioned that we launched in Davos um, called Mainstream looks to address exactly that challenge. So mm -hmm. effectively, um, how would you be able to bring together the key stakeholders in the value chain to be able to optimize that process? So it could be, and I don't know that particular example, that there isn't enough volume, purity, and ease of separation in that particular um, flow for it to be interesting enough for the uh, waste business or resource collecting business to bother to collect it up. So a bit like your example of the tree not really wanting mm -hmm. to go into mm -hmm. the right place. Now, so if you were to optimize um, that process such that, so if we take PET, kind of um, like water bottles, we know that that particular type of polymer is quite well optimized. So in fact, um, companies like Coca-Cola have actually bought into the value chain and they've specified a high um, quality material which can be quite easily separated by, section, by separation plants. So we see that PET globally has a recyclability rate of something like 47%, which is actually quite high. So in Europe, it's very, very high, for example. In the US, a bit less, and outside, um, much less. Um, so that works, right? Whereas if you look at something like polypropylene, which is huge um, uh, polymer stream used in the economy, it's 97% linear. So that means 97% of all polypropylene made ends up going to landfill or getting burnt, right? Now, if you, we've looked at how you would change that effectively. And uh, part of it is bringing together the key players around the table from your BASFs right the way through to the people who are using it, like a Unilever through to a Walmart, through to the big collectors and recyclers or a Nestle. And it would be bringing those people around the table to optimize that process and say how actually we might move to a defined palette of different types of polypropylene we're starting to use, um, but to open up those types of opportunities. And we can look to the good examples like PET and also the examples where we've got developed markets with the right infrastructure for that sorting and processing, um, like in Scandinavia, for example, to find some insight into how we can do that. Great. And actually, Bruce, would you pick up on this whole idea of these um, take back programs? Often we think about the circular economy or the circular web or the web of the economy, <laughs> building on what Dana's describing. We actually lead, we talk about the amount of material. We don't often talk about the toxic levels. So this is something that you've done a lot of work in. Could you say a few words about when we do these take backs and even just think about the circular economy, how do we think about toxins? Yeah, I mean, right now, I don't think we think about them uh, nearly enough. Um, <laughs> uh, and people are largely unaware of the different chemical makeup that is in the various consumer products that they're purchasing. Um, and I, in, in fact, I, I, I wrote a fair bit on extended producer responsibility in, in, our, in our new book. And, uh, and I, I was thinking, wow, this is going to be a great new way of you know, looking at the world. But unfortunately, when I dug into it, the programming is, is often really poor. And in fact, we're seeing these um, kind of perverse incentives happening where because more is being collected 
it's not being recycled as well as prior to the extended producer responsibility programs. Um, they're, they're just going into mass commingled waste systems where you start losing, it's exactly to your point, Jamie, you start losing the value of the individual product because it's getting lost in some huge commingled waste pile and then sent offshore because we don't have the, uh, uh, we, don't, we, do, we, we don't have the labor costs that allow you to do that kind of recycling here. So it's, it's um, yeah, I, this is where it's a system that I think is, is really failing and, uh, and we need to do something dramatically different if we're going to start uh, recovering the kinds of resources that, that we ultimately need to make it circular. Yeah, great, great. Well, um, I'm going to take this gentleman's question and then I'm going to ask you about a bold step you might take. So go ahead, sir. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to go down the, the line, starting with Peter, you know, what is the bold action we might take? And it might relate to how we might look to other parts of the world and ensure that we're not, uh, you know, uh, following the same model in other places um, and also maybe shifting our development model. So um, Peter, if you'd like to just speak about that kind of, what's a bold step we could take around the circular economy? Yeah. Well, I, I think uh, some excellent steps have already been taken. Uh, and. Um, uh, uh, just this month, the um, European Resource Efficiency Platform, which is headed up by uh, Commissioner Potoshnik, they've put a strong recommendation out to all EU member states to uh, adopt an industry symbiosis approach in their countries. And not only is it coming out in, in recommendations, it's coming out actually in legislation. So it's coming out in the um, um, Environmental legislation is coming out in economic legislation. So I, I see a good push mm. uh, um, from the uh, policymakers there. And at the same time, it's been welcomed by some of the other institutions around the world. Uh, for example, the World Wide Fund for Nature have identified it as a game changing uh, uh, way forward. And the OECD have recognized it as systemic innovation vital for future green growth. So I, I think uh, there's a lot of encouraging signs out there. And I think uh, what we need to do is, is more of it and um, increase the scale and put a, a degree of urgency behind it. Thanks, Peter. Great. Dana. Go outside. <laughs> that bold move of reconnecting with the natural world and going for walks every day. Make it part of your practice. Make it part of going for a walk in the natural world and saying, hey, how would nature solve this? And how would she not solve this? How would she not do this? Institute it as a company-wide practice to reconnect with nature. I think that bold move alone will have incredible cascading effects. Great. Thanks, Dana. Christian. Um, I agree with Peter. There are examples already out there. But I think people, they're not uh, marketed enough. So I think the the first thing that we need to do is educate, uh, present in a, in a let's say, um, benefit-focused matter, uh, benefits, inspire, and last but not least, collaborate. So we should you know, be getting together more and talk about it. Great. Wonderful. Thanks, Christian. Bruce? Yeah, well, I think we need to take the good examples that are out there and understand how well they're working. And then the bold move would be for those corporations that understand those things well, is to call upon uh, governments around the world to price, you know, put the pricing into the economic system so that that happens at scale, because I think that's the only way it's going to happen at scale. Great. Thanks, Ruth. Jamie? So uh, I was thinking of what, what you could do in 12 months, right? So I was thinking for, for Canada specifically, what would be the opportunity? And I was thinking the first thing I think would be to establish what is the size of the prize for Canada. So what does this mean in terms of economic resilience, prosperity, and jobs? Um, so a bit, little bit like this, is, this work has been done for Europe. Make it specific for Canada. The next thing within that would be to find great examples. And there will be those great examples out there and get Canadian businesses to start um, demonstrating what they're already doing around this model and what their ambitions um, are to go further. I think the second thing would be to 
also link up with the other regions globally who are very proactive around this. So like the central region of Denmark and Scotland and Wallonia and Singapore, who are very interested in the circular economy and are grappling with exactly the same challenges, that would be a very good way of sharing common barriers to progress and working around those. And I think thirdly, building more capacity. So that question about universities mm. and where can I study this, yeah. it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be that hard um, and it would be a great opportunity to find a design engineering or business school, a kind of multidisciplinary mix of higher education institutions in Canada and ask them, challenge them with this, say, what are you doing about it? What, um, you know, how could you support this, this shift? Those are my thoughts. Great, thanks so much, Jamie. And that's a great challenge for all of us in the room to think about what we might be able to do here in Canada or in the countries you come from and to really uh, take advantage of this incredible opportunity within the circular economy to start redesigning our, our businesses, our econ economics, but also our policies, our lives, and, and to get out into the world, uh, really reconnect with this web that we could uh, use as a inspiration for design. So this has really been about these emerging drivers, this uh, circular economy potential. Uh, you have the opportunity to hear uh, Peter Labor and Dana this afternoon if you'd be interested in hearing more about biomimicry or hearing more about uh, the kinds of opportunities in circular economy. Jamie's speaking tomorrow on the National Zero Waste Council, a great initiative that's been led by Metro Vancouver with other municipalities across Canada. And uh, I just would like to have you join me in thanking Jamie Butterworth, Bruce Laurie, Christian Barkin, Dana Baumaster, uh, Peter Leiborn, in, in, in shedding light on what this opportunity space can be. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you.